I'm Roger Baker, Executive Director of the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at RAIN, a global center of excellence for geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Learn how you can put geopolitics to work for your organization at RAINnetwork.com. Welcome to RAIN's Essential Geopolitics Podcast. My name is Emma Kami, and I'll be your host today. On July 10th, Turkey's president agreed to back Sweden joining NATO and to bring the issue to the Turkish National Assembly for approval. The development prompted a flurry of speculation about Turkey leaning away from Russia and more towards NATO and the West. Joining me today to discuss this is Emily Hawthorne, a senior Middle East and North Africa analyst at RAIN. Welcome, Emily. Thanks, Emma. So to start us off, uh, what about this story should we be focusing on? Yeah, so it definitely depends on sort of which angle you're coming at it from. Um, and of course, within the Middle East North Africa team at Rain, um, we're looking at this primarily from Turkey's point of view and trying to game out, okay, what was Turkey um, trying to get out of this long sort of negotiation over Sweden's accession to NATO? And what does it mean that Turkey... Um, you know, finally agreed to um, allow Sweden to, you know, back Sweden joining NATO when it did. So I think the thing to focus on um, that's just one of the angles that's important to think about is um, what does this reveal about what Turkey is trying to get um, at this juncture? And, um, you know, because we had talked before um, this happened over the last several months with a number of clients asking about Turkey and, and political risk in Turkey, asking us, okay, when or if is uh, President Erdogan going to agree to let Sweden into the NATO alliance and, and sort of what's the significance there? And our assessment, you know, throughout over the last several months has been, it, it's not a question of of if it's it's a question of when, um, and I think that to understand that it really helps to look at what is Turkey trying to um, sort of get out of um, the situation. And Turkey had a really, um, as a member of NATO, Turkey had a, a pretty um, hefty opportunity here. Um, in terms of leverage to ask from other NATO members, to ask from Sweden, to ask from the United States, um, things that Turkey wanted in exchange for Turkey agreeing to back Sweden joining NATO, which is, as we know, something that um, the rest of the NATO alliance really was dead set on, that they really, really wanted this. So that created a position of, of leverage and opportunity for Turkey that it has uh, definitely taken advantage of. And it, and just knowing that helps us understand, um, a little bit about Turkey's priorities. What does this, uh, communicate about Turkey's imperatives? So, yeah, that's exactly, um, what I think is helpful to, to game out is whether or not Turkey agreeing to, um, uh, back Sweden joining NATO, um, whether it communicates this really strong um, sort of focus on the West and a, and a preference for um, uh, making nice with NATO, with the EU, with Western countries, with the United States, whether it communicates that um, or whether this is part of the broader sort of Turkish um, balancing act um, that we have become familiar with over um, really the duration of President Erdogan's tenure as, as the the um, sort of chief leader in Turkey. Um, I think it's really important that we consider how Turkey is continuing to balance between uh, its relationship with Russia, making sure that it gets what it needs and wants out of that relationship with its relationship with the West and getting what it wants and needs out of that relationship. And by that, I mean that we don't think that um, Turkey um, being 
more friendly with NATO and and doing things that, that NATO wants, we don't think that that indicates that Russia and Turkey are um, seeing, you know, big disruptions in their relationship um, that are going to be um, disruptive over the long term. We think that um, right now the sort of pendulum in that balance is definitely swinging more towards the West, but that it still is a pendulum. It still is a spectrum um, and that Turkey is always going to be um, sort of looking opportunistically to both sides of that and and moving um, when it suits Turkey's interests. At this juncture, what we know about Turkey's imperatives at this moment um, in time in 2023, Turkey and the Turkish government, specifically under Erdogan, they have just uh, finished this very notable general election in which um, President Erdogan won re-election for a third term. Um, so they've sort of come out of the woods um, and uh, positioned themselves in a way uh, where they they don't have to worry about um, sort of electoral pressures. Um, they don't have to worry about um, some of the optics of uh, looking weak, kowtowing to the West. Um, they can really focus on what Turkey needs. And a big component of what Turkey needs right now is economic stabilization. And I think to get that, it makes more sense to um, be as friendly as possible with the West right now, to usher in that kind of foreign investment that Turkey really needs right now, to sort of bolster and and reaffirm those ties with Europe and with NATO countries um, that already exist, but could use some polishing up, some strengthening, um, you know, some, some reinforcement. Um, because some of that has been damaged over the last few years um, as uh, President Erdogan has um, sort of pushed against European interests and and pushed against what NATO has asked of of Turkey um, by growing more close to Russia and by being an independent actor. And um, in some ways that allows Turkey to be this sort of mediator, which is really valuable not only for Turkey, but, but also for Russia and for the West. Um, but it also has made Turkey out to be more pro-Russian than pro-Western. And I think, again, the point I'm really just trying to hammer home here is that Turkey is going to continue to play both sides. Turkey is going to continue to act by whatever Turkey's interests are, not by ultimately what NATO's interests are or by what Russia's interests are. Um, and right now, Turkey needs economic stabilization um, and being as friendly as possible with NATO, um, acting in such a way uh, that shows an alignment with 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 NATO's priorities, that is really helpful for um, Turkey's economy in the long term. Also, another key point we should mention is that a huge part of these negotiations um, were the um, a huge part of it was the F sixteen issue, the F sixteen fighter jets um, that Turkey had asked the United States for um, in October twenty twenty one. Um, and there has been, you know, almost two years of sort of back and forth tug of war over whether or not Turkey was <clears throat> going to receive those, as well as some modernization kits for Turkey's existing planes. Um, we saw that the United States said shortly after um, uh, Turkey agreed to back Sweden's accession to NATO, the United States said, we are allowing the transfer of the F-16s to go through. So very clearly that was a huge part of the negotiation and the U.S. was extending the completion and fruition of that deal um, in exchange for Turkey agreeing to back this Sweden accession, something that the United States wants and the rest of NATO wanted very, very badly. Um, and that is also very sort of simple to see that Turkey got something that it wanted for its own national security um, out of playing the negotiation and the leverage with the uh, Sweden accession issue. So I think I think the that in terms of like what does this communicate about Turkey's imperatives, I think it communicates that Turkey is always going to continue to to play this balancing act. Right now it's leaning a bit more towards the West, but that that is not a, a foregone conclusion on and on in the long term. And 
What exactly could disrupt then this Western focus that they have right now? So when you think about the friction points that have already disrupted um, Turkey's ties with uh, Western countries, with Europe, with Sweden in particular, or with the United States, there's a whole host of issues. And um, Turkey is um, in a you know good phase right now with NATO, but any one of those friction points that are familiar could resurface again. That includes um, you know human rights violations. That includes um, election shenanigans. There are local elections in Turkey in 2024, early 2024, um, and there could be some things that maybe some European election monitors sort of raise flags about um, that Turkey and Turkey will not take kindly to that. Um, um, There could also be um, more pressure on the fact that Turkey is unlikely to wholeheartedly join in any kind of sanctions campaign against Russia, because again, as part of that balancing act, it's going to, Ankara is going to try and preserve its relationship with Russia, even if it's, it's kind of rebalancing toward the West right now, it's not going to drop the Russian side of, of that spectrum. So, um, and, and that could cause friction, um, with, uh, the West and with NATO, um, And there's also all sorts of other things, you know, Turkish policy in Syria. Um, If Turkey does something that is viewed by European powers as as something that could um, aggravate existing migrant crises, that's something that's going to create friction um, that could spoil the current state of 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 harmony. So it's 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 really like a big menu of potential things that that could happen. and it's it's really a question of continuing to track and closely follow what Turkey's interests are in each and every situation in order for us to understand what is likely to take place. Well, thank you so much, Emily. I'm sure we'll be hearing many more updates from you on Turkey as this develops. No worries. You can learn how geopolitical events like this could affect your business with Rain Worldview. Our flagship risk intelligence products provide clients with access to the insights and analyses they need to make more informed decisions and drive better risk management outcomes. Sign up at rainnetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E network.com. I'm Emma Kami. Thanks for listening.